This episode is brought to you by Shopify. Do you have a point of sale system you can trust or is it <clears throat> a real POS? You need Shopify for retail. From accepting payments to managing inventory, Shopify POS has everything you need to sell in person. Go to shopify.com slash system, all lowercase, to take your retail business to the next level today. That's shopify.com slash system. Hi there. Thank you so much for checking out Raising Me. This is where we talk about the parts of parenting that can be confusing or frustrating Maybe things nobody ever told us about or taught us about, so we reach out to the experts for guidance. I'm Adrian Stein, a mom of three and a longtime journalist, and today we are talking about why politics are important and the simple ways to explain this to our kids. We're not going to go into, like, which candidate did this, said that, all that craziness right now. We're really just taking it down to the basics of how politics impact our everyday lives. Things like roads, schools the safety of the food we eat. Plus, this is a big one. We're gonna talk about the importance of verifying sources, especially for our teens who are seeing articles and video clips online right now. So whether it's how to break it down simply for your little one or diving deeper with your older kids, there's something in this conversation for you. We are chatting with Ben Marjot, very cool guy. He is a political reporter and host of Ballot Battleground Nevada, covering the really complex issues and the candidates that shape policy in his swing state and beyond. So he's gonna share the story of how he became so passionate about covering politics and just government and civics in general, plus the lessons that we can share with our kids. So also, little side note here, we know how quickly the current political climate is changing right now. So just a little bit of a heads up. When uh, we do talk about the current events, this episode was actually recorded several weeks ago before that recent debate. So check it out. Ben, as a political reporter who lives and breathes politics and all this stuff, is your head spinning? Because I feel like (laughs) every time I turn on the TV or open any social media app, there's, there's always a new headline. Yeah. And it's not just the, it's just not just the news of the day. We've had multiple world altering, you know, U.S. political altering events, earth shifting events in the political scene just in the last uh, couple of weeks, certainly in the last month. Uh, You're talking about the assassination attempt on former President Trump, the RNC picking J.D. Vance, Biden dropping out, Democrats circling around Kamala Harris. It's been unbelievable. That doesn't even include earlier this year when Trump was convicted. I mean, it's just been absolutely mind boggling to try and wrap our heads around all of this happening all at once. But it's been fun. I mean, this is why I love what I do. You know, it's interesting. I just admittedly, I'm not somebody who like is has an insatiable appetite for politics. But right now, and I think that's sort of the sentiment for a lot of people is you just like, on one hand, it's like, okay, please stop with the rhetoric and all the negativity. But on the other (laughs) hand, it's like you just can't get enough information. It's like this insatiable appetite to yeah. learn more, to know more. I'm curious how you got interested, so interested in politics that this became your career. Yeah, I mean, I guess it probably started back in high school taking AP U.S. history and AP world history. And then I think it was government senior year. And I just love those classes. I actually had a really great AP U.S. government teacher that just kind of sparked this love of paying attention to our government and how politics works and um, kind of was interested in journalism, of course, went to journalism school and the sports route. I wanted to cover sports for a little while, didn't enjoy that as much after some time and really found a true passion and calling, I think, for covering news. And it just so happened that in 2016, when I was getting ready to graduate, uh, I was in Arizona at Arizona State and Not quite a full-on swing state yet at the time, but we were getting a lot of visits from presidential contenders, and I got to cover my first political rally, and it was Senator Ted Cruz, who was running for president in that chaotic, crazy 2016 Republican primary and got to be at one of his events, and I don't know, just something about the energy of covering a political rally was something that I enjoyed, and I love being able to 
question politicians, to hold them to account. And I got the chance to interview a couple of politicians and I, I just fell in love with it there. I got the job at News 4 here in Reno later that year. And our longtime, very experienced, well-respected legislative reporter retired you know, a month before the legislative session, I think, and there was a morning meeting and who wants to go cover the state legislature down in Carson City? And I'm, you know, 21, 22 years old, fresh out of college and I just raised my hand in the meeting. And all right, sure enough, Ben's going down to Carson City and kind of the rest is history. So I, I love it. It, was there a big competition for going down to Carson City? <laughs> <laughs> there usually isn't. I mean, you've been in newsrooms, you know, it's kind of, it can be the short end of the stick, but sure can um, be. So, news directors love it when there's a reporter that's eager to get down and, and cover politics. And that has kind of been my jam ever since then. I love it. You know, because the reality is, is political decisions impact almost everything. I mean, our daily lives in so many ways, whether it's you know, the simplicity of making sure roads are maintained so they're safe to drive on or um, your food is safe to eat. I mean, that's just sort of some everyday examples. Obviously, yeah. there are big examples that are happening in the um, political discussion today. But, you know, why do you think it's important in particular for our kids to understand this connection between government and political decisions and, you know, the things that they probably like many of us kind of take for granted every day. Certainly. I mean, the connection, every single part of your life is connected in some way to a decision that a government at some level, whether it be federal, state or local, has made at some point. Clean drinking water, food safety and quality, um, the safety of the world, obviously, when you look at wars and how the U.S. is a player on the world stage. Um, and locally, I always say that government closest to the people has the most impact on your daily life, how far your new school in your neighborhood is built, whether or not the roads are safe for you to walk and bike on. And so there is just this unbelievable connection to every aspect of our lives. Sometimes I think I can sometimes be guilty of this. Certainly the national media are guilty of portraying politics as a horse race, a competition, uh, as a battle. And the name of my podcast is Ballot Battlegrounds. I'm really guilty of this to, at sometimes too, uh, when really it's our job as journalists to explain and make it real, make these policies real for people. Because yes, of course, it is interesting to follow the back and forth and the polls and who's up and who's going to win and who's going to lose. And this, it's this contest or competition when really uh, the impetus should be on us to explain to our viewers, but also our kids how it's going to impact your everyday life for uh, forever. Well, and you have a little one who is absolutely adorable, little boy. <laughs> have you envisioned, I mean, you know, he's little, right? Like around two years old. So mm -hmm. but yeah, you just turned two. envisioned, you know, what teaching him about these things would, would look like and, and what does that look like? Yeah, it's a great question. And it's honestly great time to be on this podcast because now that he's just turned two, his vocabulary is expanding exponentially every single day. And obviously he's not paying attention to the news yet. He knows the word news because his dad is on the news and his mom works for the news. Uh, but he's not really paying attention yet. But I'm so glad you brought me on this podcast because it started to get the wheels turning in my head of, okay, now that he's learning language and going to start to pick up on things over the next year, two years, definitely. But by the time he's in kindergarten, he's going to be aware of the events that are happening in the world. How do we want to have a household that talks about these matters in a respectful way, finding the balance between talking about politics too much in the home, but you also want your children to kind of grow up with your perspective and your worldview to some extent. So it's a, a fine line and really excited to start thinking about that. Me and my wife had the, the first conversation since you invited me on this podcast and, you know, how do we want to think about that? Yeah, it's a little bit too early for us, but I'm curious how you talk about politics in your home with uh, older children, right? A middle schooler and a high schooler? I, I We do. You know, I, I will say, um, spending the vast majority of my career in journalism, we were very conscientious of not sharing, or I was, you know, my political affiliation, really encouraging them to make their own decisions. Part of that just 
again, to the the idea of being impartial as a journalist, you know, worried that they would go to a friend's house and says, well, my mom is going to vote for whatever. <laughs> right, and I really right. take, I've always taken that incredibly seriously as, as a journalist. So, you know, our conversations now are really about, well, where did you find that information? Well, what do you think about it? Kind of turning it around and talking about the importance of just being educated in this space and not just believing something on the surface, like trust but verify, which is something sure. that yeah. <laughs> we, you know, we say quite often in the news. But um I almost yeah, think there's so it, a men- it's, it's kind of a, a delicate dance, right? Yeah, I almost think there's kind of a mentality of, and we're trained in this as journalists, talking about politics around your children as if you were um you know, you want to let your guard down, of course, and tell them your feelings to some extent, of but course. you want to present to them the most objective, fact-based accounting of the events of the day, of politics, of news, so that they can kind of form their own opinions. That's the mission that we do on the do- news every single night. And there's a lot of parallels in probably trying to have that same exact mentality at home. Now, obviously, it's your kids, you're at home, you can let your guard down a little bit, you don't have to totally. be full on news anchor voice, but to present the information in the same way to them, give them the tools to be able to research their own sources, trust, but verify, as you say, to find out information and research these issues on their own to empower them to kind of think critically and come to conclusions on their own, I think is, is a really special thing. We haven't, as I said, my son just barely turned two, so he's not there yet, but I hope and imagine and um, look forward to that being kind of the mentality in our household. Yeah. And I will say as my, my kids have gotten older, particularly like I have a 16, almost she'll be 17 in the, in the fall. Um, and then I have a middle schooler, like as they're older, we have a little bit more open, frank conversations about why we may feel this way or that way. But again, really kind of putting it back on them to make their own decisions. You know, one of the things too, just working as a reporter, particularly as a political reporter, is this idea, this skill to break down really complex Sometimes yeah. quite boring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Let's be real. <laughs> preaching um, to the choir here. Message, messaging and, and ideas and complex, you know, ideas to break it down into like bite size, easy to digest information. So like what are some of the ways that you can do that or you might do that when you're talking about government or some of the issues that are Um, at the forefront today. This episode is brought to you by Shopify. Do you have a point of sale system you can trust or is it a real POS? You need Shopify for retail. From accepting payments to managing inventory, Shopify POS has everything you need to sell in person. Go to shopify.com slash system, all lowercase, to take your retail business to the next level today. That's shopify.com slash system. Yeah, well, the formal education, at least for me, started, I think, freshman year of high, you would know better than me, freshman year of high school is like your first official history and government class, right? But I mean, I really think that education should start in the home and and sooner than that, because uh, as in middle school and probably even at the end of elementary school, they're starting to see what's happening on the news and wondering maybe how the government works and, um, as you say, just making it very simple. These are the three branches of government. You know, we put so much focus on the presidential race and especially Congress, but there's the judicial branch. What does the Supreme Court do? Um, And really open it up for them. Ask questions. What do you want to know? How does this policy make you feel? How does this policy affect certain people? What are you hearing about it from your friends at school or mm. uh, your friends, your parents, yeah, the, your the parents of your friends um, and really just turning it back on them to kind of hear what they're hearing and the information that they've kind of collected to kind of understand a little bit about their worldview. And again, yeah, simplifying it down to the basics on this is how the executive branch can affect your life. They have to work together with the legislative branch and the judicial branch and kind of 
making it so that when they get to that first government class, that history class, they already have a base of information to go off of, oh, my mom and dad talked about this when I was a little kid. Right. They're starting, they're not starting flat footed. Like they have a a basic understanding of it. And look, like the reality is is if parents haven't done that yet, it's not too late, right? Like politics (laughs) and understanding government is not for everybody. However, you know, we are in the middle of a election cycle right now. It is certainly, we know our kids are getting this information from somewhere, if not from, <laughs> at, from home. So, you know, ideally just incorporating that, those conversations into our homes will, will set them up for um, success. You know, just yeah. thinking in terms of like civic activities, like what age do you think we should encourage our kids to get involved in, in civic activities? Never too young, honestly. Really? Um, okay. So one of my favorite parts about being a political reporter, election days are very stressful. You're going all day long. But the best part of my election day is when I see a young person walk into the voting booth. Um, it's a baby or a toddler or a young child with their parents to go vote. I think that's just the most awesome thing, just to expose them to that from a very young age. I was working, I think, when I voted in this last election, so I didn't bring my son. But next time, he's coming to the polls with me. And then another great thing is seeing that first-time voter, 18, 19, maybe 20 years old, fresh out of high school or hopefully still in high school, voting for the first time in Nevada. Uh, You get a certificate. You get uh, Oftentimes, the poll workers will take your picture. If I'm there at the polling place, the news comes over and takes your picture. And it's just a really cool moment to kind of impress upon a young voter, a first time voter, how important that is, and to hopefully take that responsibility very seriously for the rest of their lives. And get those little I voted stickers. Yes, the sticker. I have a collection every time that I voted since I became, and maybe, hey, this is be a great thing to do for people too. collect those I voted stickers because I've lived in a couple different states now. I have several different states and counties of I voted stickers. And it's just, um, cool little piece of memorabilia to have to look back and say, you know, I voted in every single election. Here's the sticker to prove it. Um, and I think it's just, yeah, taking your kids along to go vote when they're 16 or 17, you can pre-register to them to vote in a lot of states so that as soon as they turn 18, boom, you can go vote in that next election. Um, if it's going to a political rally, of course, those can be very interesting nowadays. I don't know if I'd bring my young child to political rally, but if you are, you know, take them to rallies for candidates on both sides. And so they can kind of experience, or at least if you're in a state like we are, where we have candidates coming all the time, watch some of their campaign visits on social media. So you can kind of expose them to both sides of the aisle and not just um, the politicians that their parents like. You know, I do, I do love that idea of um, the, the I voted stickers in like a, a journal or like a page and then writing down where you were, who you voted for. That's like a, a pro tip. That'd be kind of fun to look back. Yeah, on. I even I vote on uh, and I obviously won't tell you who I voted for, but I vote, you know, who was the candidate at the top of the ticket that I voted for in that year. And so that I can kind of and I write that on the sticker so I can kind of look back um, and say, OK, this is kind of how I was feeling as a voter and back in 2016 and my first elect or 2014, my first election. So it's kind of a cool thing to look back on and could be a fun thing to do with your kids or not kids, teenagers and young adults. (laughs) Well, speaking of the teenager, like, you know, I have a 16 year old and it wasn't that long ago, you know, we were unpacking a box that I don't know why we still had it packed. It was, <laughs> her baby book was in there. And I realized in 2008, I put the I voted sticker in her baby book because it was the first election like I took her to at the That's time. That's awesome. Yeah. What a cool memory that you so, guys now have. Yeah. Well, she was like, she would have been, you know, had just turned one. Okay. In 2000, you know, fall of 2008. But anyway, and then that's, of course, dating myself probably a little bit, but um, <laughs> neither here nor there. You know, what I want to talk about, too, is just the current events and media literacy in particular. Um, mm, there yeah. is, a, you know, look, no secret. There is so much misinformation out there right now. Yeah. Uh, it is mind boggling often. You know, it's right in the palm of our hands, in our kids' hands. Mm-hmm. So, you know, how would how would you explain the concept of misinformation? 
Yeah, I would start from a place of if you are on social media, and I don't know if your kids are, I imagine they aren't because they're in middle school and high school. Everyone is. Um, <laughs> start from a place of skepticism. So much of the information that you and we are seeing out there is misinformation, disinformation, misleading, if it's not coming from a trusted, verifiable, objective source. And I think from a very young age, as soon as a child has an iPad or an iPhone in their hand and they're seeing information about the world out there, it's probably time to start that conversation because mm -hmm. as we know, misinformation moves at the speed of light and the wrong information will get in front of their faces before the correct information will because it's um, sensationalized or um, exciting or, you know, more, what's the word I'm looking for here? Uh, scary potentially. And so yeah. sometimes that misinformation it's an spreads really fast. It. Right. It grabs your attention. Yeah. It is juiced by the algorithms that are driving all of these platforms. And so it gets in front of people's eyeballs so much faster than you know, the work that we do as journalists to try and fact check and get the correct proper information out there. So I think it's really just impressing upon them how critical it is to not just see and believe, not believe something just because someone, a talking head on TikTok or Instagram is saying it, but to go to that person's page, to look them up online, to see who they work for, if they have an employer, if they're doing this as a content creator what their motivations are, what their biases are, why they are doing this, and to really question that, that doesn't necessarily mean that everything that you see from an influencer or from a certain you know source that's not the news is invalid. I'm not saying that, but just th to keep that in the back of your mind as you're seeing sources that you might be questioning and should be questioning, um, some of the information might be coming from a place of they're trying to do activism as opposed to reporting. And we just have to keep that in the back of our heads. Yeah, that's great advice. I, you know, my daughter, my son is not on any social media right now. Thank goodness. Not interested, at least at <laughs> yeah. the moment. Uh, I'm sure that day comes. But, you know, my 16 year old has Instagram and, and TikTok. And while we spot check it every now and then, the reality is, is it, it, I have no idea what is showing yeah. up on her feeds right now. Now, she's not like real hot into politics, so I'm I'm not sure the algorithm is feeding her that, but you know, just being conscientious that that could she very well could run into those those yeah. messages that just are not and all it, based in fact. Yeah, and all it takes is really the algorithms are paying attention to our attention so closely that all it takes is really say on TikTok, you know, watching a video for 10 seconds too long and the algorithm realized, oh, they were interested in that. And yes. they slowly start to mix it into your, to your for you page. And you start seeing similar videos and it can really kind of draw you in very quickly. So it really doesn't take much. Yeah, you're so right. You know, I think just curious of your own process, how do you as a political reporter in this climate sort through those things as well because you know regard of course this is important for our middle schoolers and teenagers yeah. who are being fed this sort of when we may or may not have our eyes on it but it's important for us as adults who are consuming it and parents who are consuming this information too so just curious about your process as a journalist in these times how you navigate that fact from fiction and the misinformation that it seems to be on so many platforms. Yeah. I, especially as a reporter who has seen so much of this bad information out there for years now, I'm, I'm a cynic. So I am skeptical of everything that I see until I have been able to verify it and go down the rabbit hole to make sure that it's legitimate. Um, that doesn't mean that I'm, uh, I occasionally, you know, oh, and I, and my brain is tricked into thinking, oh, that's legit. And okay, I have to do my research, even if it's just something unrelated, you know, there's misinformation out there having to deal with sports. And I'll give you an example is kind of unrelated, but there was a sports highlight that yesterday that I saw, and it was not true. It was from a couple of years ago, but it tricked my brain and I didn't even look at it because I was kind of off guard because it was about sports. And I don't know. It's just a good lesson for me that even if it's something innocuous, like a sports highlight, you know, there's, this wasn't 
malicious or anything, or it wasn't a bad actor. It was just a joke, but you really do need to be kind of on guard at all times. Yeah, sure. Verify, verify, ver- verify. <laughs> if your mother uh, says is- she loves you, check it out. That's the phrase from Do journalism you know, school. I was literally going to say, say yeah. that again. <laughs> if your mother says she loves you, check it out. It's so funny. I went to the University of Missouri uh, J school there many years ago. Mm-hmm. That great we used that line program. there. Mm-hmm. Huh? Yeah, great journalism program. So, it sure yeah. is. It sure is. Yeah, but it's funny that 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 was a line we used as well. So, uh, if you, your mom tells you <laughs> she loves you, check that out. Yeah. Um. Ben, this is so but not much your fun. kids, but not your kids. I was just going to say, but not your kids. No, no, they you know. Lo- yeah, they don't need to check it out. They, they know. know. They tell me to back off. <laughs> <laughs> um. Anyway, Ben, this is so much fun. I am so grateful that you were able to join us. Um, if there was one takeaway for us parents when it comes to these conversations that really are important to be having with our kids right now, what would that be? I don't even know if it's a takeaway about how to have conversations with your kid, but be mindful and cognizant, conscientious of the conversations that you might have Mm. with your spouse, with your other family members at family gatherings. They are so impressionable. Uh, even I, you know, my son is two and he's picking up on things that my, me and my wife are talking about. So we already have to be on guard about that. They feed off of our energy so much. And so if politics are a huge stressor in your home, because let's be honest, the events of the world can be stressful. There's a war in Gaza. You know, there was someone that tried to assassinate the president. I mean, these are stressful, heavy, difficult topics to talk about. But if they become over consuming or all consuming in your home among parents, um, that can obviously rub off on your children and make them uh, kind of feel that energy too. So it's just being mindful of that and also having respectful dialogues about politics in the home. You know, if parents agree on a topic, uh, you know, there's probably not going to be very many debates about politics inside the home. Um, But certainly if parents, and we know this, families disagree about politics all the time, family gatherings. And so um, trying to have those in a respectful responsible manner that we're not yelling and screaming at each other about politics uh, and really modeling for them how to have good dialogues about the issues that are focused on the issues that are refraining from personal attacks and um, things like that. And so it's just, it's, you got to kind of be, and this is, this is parenthood, right? It's no matter the topic, you got to be always conscientious of every single little thing that you do or say can be picked up on by your kids. And it is, I will yeah. say. <laughs> ben, thank you so much. Such great information. And really thank you for the work that you're doing right now to help everybody stay informed. Really appreciate your time today. Thank you for having me on. This has been a pleasure. I really enjoyed talking with Ben. And I look, I'm going to just admit right here, like politics has never been my thing. Not that I didn't really care. It's just more that... I don't know, just complex. I'd figure out who I'm voting for, and that was kind of the end of it. But as I get older, oh my gosh, that has really changed right now in particular. I just have an insatiable appetite for it, especially leading up to the presidential election. And what I've come to realize in a takeaway from that conversation with Ben, you know, one thing he said was his job as a reporter is to explain and make these policies real for people. But just switch out reporter for parent, right? And our job as our children get older and more aware of the world around them is to help them understand, help make these policies and these politics real or relatable and understandable for our kids. It's not just the quote unquote, you know, battle between two or more people. It's what do you want your roads to be like, schools to look like? It's policies that shape, you know, how clean our water is. So much of our everyday lives. So I. I really do want my kids to grow up with a deeper understanding of the importance of how their vote can help shape their lives. Thank you so much for listening to Raising Me. I'm Adrienne Stein. This episode is edited by Megan Littlefield and produced with Nate Eldridge. Please follow Raising Me wherever you get your podcasts and give us a like and share to a friend, say, maybe to your social pages too, so others can find this message as well. 
Wherever you are, I hope you learned something new and get to take a little time for you.